Hello and welcome to video 4, acid-base theory and some additional concepts. Um, I want to review the idea of the hydronium ion. Hydrogen ions are not really free in an acidic solution. Water molecules strip the hydrogen from the anion, forming the hydronium ion. Uh, this, is, this is what happens when an acid is dissolved in water. Really, the water molecules are attractive to the hydrogen ion, so it grabs on. Um, and here that is in a, a balanced reaction. When we write things in this unit, uh, to reiterate, hydro hydronium and hydrogen are interchangeable. You will see use, both of them used throughout chemistry. We'll also refer to hydrogen ion as a proton. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. The Arrhenius theory, the, an Arrhenius acid ionizes an aqueous solution to produce a hydronium ion, or hydrogen ion. Arrhenius base contains hydroxide ion and ionizes in water to produce hydroxide ion. And you have reactions there to support that idea. This is the original theory by Sponti Arrhenius. Um, so we can look at these four atom, four um, cup substances and decide if this would be an Arrhenius acid or base. And it's, it is quite uh, intuitive. So acids are things that contain hydrogen ions, and you would expect to make hydrogen ions in water. And bases are things that contain hydroxide and would make hydroxide in water. So there you go. Disadvantages, you can only apply Arrhenius theory to things that occur in water. Acids can occur in the gas form and in the gas phase. Um, many bases and some acids uh, don't contain uh, the operative piece, in this case of like ammonia, it doesn't contain hydroxide. But when you expose ammonia to water, it strips hydroxides off the water molecules to form um, the hydroxide. Hydrogen ion, as I said earlier, is a proton. A hydrogen atom contains a single proton and a single electron, so when it loses an electron, all that remains is a proton. Hence, hydrogen ions are referred to often in this unit as protons. In fact, there's an entire class of pharmaceuticals designed to limit uh, acid in the stomach called proton pump inhibitors. They inhibit the body's ability in the stomach to secrete hydrogen ions to create the acidic environment your, your stomach has. Um, but that's a topic for you for a little bit later on in your career. The next theory we need to talk about is the Bronsted-Lowry theory, and this is the reigning theory for acids and bases. Uh, in Bronsted-Lowry theory, substances are defined by their actions. It's all about the exchange of protons. And so when we look at this reaction here, we'll see this on this page and the next, we're comparing and looking for where the hydrogen ion is moving to and from, and which one is moving from reactant to product. Okay, It's like before and after. So you should be analyzing, looking to see the hydrogen ion travel from one molecule to another, and that makes your products. So the bronsillary acid is a reactant that donates a proton, okay? And so you look up here, which reactant is losing a proton? Look before, look after. It's a hydrochloric acid. It's losing a proton, giving it to water, and leaving behind this chloride ion, and then hydronium ion. The base is a reactant that accepts that proton. So water is accepting hydrogen's proton here. So water is a base, hydrochloric acid is an acid. On the other side of the reaction, we refer to these as conjugates, okay? They're the, the buddy, they're what really remains after something on the reactant side. The conjugate acid is the product that forms after the Bronsted-Lowry base accepts a hydrogen, so that's hydronium here. The conjugate acid now has that hydrogen. If you'll notice, whichever species has the hydrogen in reactant or product is referred to as the acid. If you look at this reaction going the other way, you could see hydronium giving a hydrogen to chloride, making hydrochloric acid, um, but you see the idea there. Um, Bronsted-Lowry conjugate base is the product that forms after the Bronsted-Lowry acid has donated a hydrogen. So this is what's left, the conjugate base chloride ion. Um, we're going to use this process to build two conjugate pairs on these Lewis structures. So what we need to do right now is look and see what sticks to what here, okay? What is changing into what else? Um, which reactant on which reactant is going to lose a hydrogen ion? So you look here and you're looking to see what changed in this molecule. They're a little different in their drawing, but the big idea is still there. So what changed? We should note here we have a hydrogen here that we do not have here. That means that it was lost. We should note that we have water here that is turned into hydronium here. In other words, it's gained a hydrogen. That makes this the acid because it's losing the hydrogen makes this the base. What a base gaining the hydrogen after is now the conjugate acid. It's got the, the hydrogen. Okay, conjugate acid now has that hydrogen it gained, and then the conjugate base is what's left after the acid is donated as hydrogen on the product side. So, the questions. Which reactant loses a hydrogen? This is the acid. The partner on the product side missing that hydrogen is the conjugate base. Just to connect those with the arrow, we'll do that in a second. Which one gains a hydrogen? That's water. 
That's the base. Its new partner is called the conjugate acid. The conjugates are always going to be on the product side. Okay, you may hear draw conjugate acid and base pairs. That's going to be the thing before and after. Conjugate acid becomes a conjugate base. The base becomes conjugate acid. Let's draw those arrows now. So, acid conjugate base pair, base conjugate acid pair. Okay? You're following a hydrogen ion movement. So, uh, a factoid we need to know, and I can support it with a little bit of background, is that um, strong, strong acids, when they ionize, make weak conjugate bases and that's because you would not expect that you would not expect that chloride ion to grab hydrogen and make hydrochloric acid that's because the hydrochloric acid in this in water is not going to form remember it's a strong electrolyte it's a strong acid it's going to ionize completely so in a solution of water you're going to have all this and virtually none of this and because of that, that's basically saying this chloride cannot grab hydrogen to form hydrochloric acid, so it's a weak conjugate base. This is our conjugate base, this is our acid. Strike that on the other side, we have a weak acid, like hydrofluoric acid, um, is not going to form much ion in solution. We said it was a weak acid, so virtually all of our solution is hydrofluoric acid intact, and very little is going to be on the product side. So you would, you would think that this substance is going to be great at grabbing hydrogen ions to form hydrofluoric acid so you have a strong conjugate base okay so let's check that box here a weak acid makes a strong conjugate base a strong acid makes a weak conjugate base and that's also true for bases we need to talk about amphoteric substances also known as amphiprotic substances they can act as a acid in some reactions and as a base in others. I mean, it depends on the situation, but what it ultimately means is that the substance itself is able to gain a hydrogen or lose a hydrogen ion, a proton. So, um, well, I don't want to go back yet. When, I, when we look at that, we need to think about, you know, the, the possibilities. If you have something like um, the hydrogen carbonate ion, hydrogen carbonate ion can gain a hydrogen um, and become H2CO3 carbonic acid. All right, that's it acting as a base. It can also lose a hydrogen ion, that's a hydrogen ion, and form carbo uh, the, the carbonate ion. This is it acting as an acid. Either is, is possible with this because it's amphiprotic. It, it can go either way. So when, when we're asked questions about amph amphoteric or amphiprotic substances, and by the way, I said amphiprotic because it gets said a lot so much that I just said it. Um, we can look at that molecule and decide, is it able to gain a hydrogen ion? If so, what's its new formula? Okay, and we'll play with that in class. We can define acids uh, by how many hydrogen ions they're able to donate. And it's just some simple terminology, monoprotic, diprotic, triprotic. And it's coincidental with the, no, it, sorry, and it reflects the number of, of ions they're able to give. An example of a monoprotic acid would be like hydrofluoric acid. Per molecule, it can only give one hydrogen. Carbonic can give two. Phosphoric acid can give three. Bases can also be defined this way. Monobasic, dibasic, tribasic. The numbers they can offer the same way. An example of a monobasic base, hydrogen sulfite can accept one hydrogen. Hydrogen sulfate, pardon me, can accept a hydrogen and becomes sulfuric acid. I'm going to write these out. If it gains a hydrogen ion, it becomes sulfuric acid. Okay. Dibasic carbon carbonate ion can gain two and become H2CO3. Phosphate phosphate ion can gain three and become H3PO4. So basically, it's I don't like using the word basically in this unit, but essentially what we see is that um, there is room for uh, a certain number of hydrogen ions to be gained in monobasic, tribasic, dibasic bases. The notion of strength versus concentration is important also. When we look at concentration, it simply is that, mol that molar value. We notice in the first example we have same molarity and they're both strong acids, so that's all, um, all we have to say here. In the second example, we have a lower molarity of hydrochloric acid and a stronger molarity of hydrobromic. So both are strong, but hydrobromic acid is more concentrated. The third example, we have both 0.1 molar, but we have a weak acid, acetic acid, and a strong acid hydrochloric. Hydrochloric is strong, same concentration. And then finally, we have citric acid and phosphoric acid, where phosphoric is more dilute. So our, uh, they're both weak acids, but our 
our citric acid is more concentrated than the phosphoric acid. So whenever we're discussing acids and bases in terms of relative strength and concentration, we're not just looking at it saying, oh, that's a strong acid. Uh, it's important to understand that a weak acid can be very dangerous to you. Just because it doesn't ionize well in water doesn't mean that it can't react with your skin. That's a common misconception. So when we're assessing an acid, it's important to look at concentration and strength. Finally, we need to talk about acidic and basic salts. Um, when you have a neutralization reaction uh, take place, you know that our products are always going to be an acid and a base. Um, uh, making water and a salt. Okay, so three of those, three of those, one of these, one of these. So this is a balanced reaction. If we perfectly neutralize these, nothing left, only this left. We have to acknowledge that this compound here in solution is going to leave aluminum ions and chloride ions. Okay, the chloride ions are going to stay in solution, we know that. The aluminum ions, though, are probably going to bind onto water to take on aluminum hydroxide, and it's going to leave behind hydrogen ions. Really, what you need to know here that is that um, aluminum chloride came from aluminum hydroxide and, and hydrochloric acid. Because of that, you had a strong acid and a weak base. Your solution, when it's completely neutralized, is going to have a slightly acidic pH because of that salt that's formed. Okay? slightly acidic, 5 to 7 pH, okay? Strike that and reverse it, we have a weak parent acid and a strong parent base in lithium acetate, and because of that, we have a pH of 7 to 9, okay? We have a strong parent base and a weak parent acid. We have a pH of 7 to 9. You might then guess that a neutral salt is formed from a strong acid and a strong base, and pH is right at 7, okay? So these phenomena together uh, help us predict that when we have our neutralized solution, we don't necessarily have a pH of 7. If the, if the salt we form is an acidic salt, the pH is 5 to 7. If the salt we form is a basic salt, the pH is 7 to 9. The way we recognize that is by looking at our salt and taking our cation, bonding it to hydroxide, and asking, strong or weak? Lithium hydroxide, group 1, alkali metal hydroxide is strong, and then binding hydrogen ion to our anion making hydrochloric acid also strong and then letting that drive our decision. So let's do this table together and that'll be that. Sodium nitrate, remember we're going to bond hydroxide to our cation and hydrogen to our anion. So sodium hydroxide is our parent base, that's strong. And then HNO3 is nitric acid, also strong. So that's going to be a strong, uh, sorry, that's going to be a neutral salt and a predicted pH would be about 7. Iron 3 sulfate, we we're going to bind hydroxide to the iron and hydrogen to the, to the sulfate. And so our parent acid is H2SO4, sulfuric acid. That's one of our seven strong. And then our base is going to be iron 3 hydroxide. That's not a strong base, so that's a weak base. Strong acid. So this is an acidic salt. An acidic salt has a pH of 5 to 7. Finally, calcium phosphite, calcium hydroxide is a strong base, plus 2, minus 1, that's why it's CaOH2, and then H2, or H3PO3 is phosphorus, let me fix that, H3PO3 is phosphorus, OUS acid, and this is a weak acid. This is a strong base, so our pH will be 7 to 9 because this is a basic salt. So what you're doing is tearing down your salt to determine if it's an acidic salt, a basic salt, or a neutral salt, and predicting the, the pH of the solution at equivalence. Okay, so this concludes video 4 for acids, theory, and concepts. You should have taken high-quality notes. Please re-watch any portion of this video you feel you need to watch. Come to class with questions.